Hi, welcome to another of our LTS webinars. We're very happy to have you around. And before we begin, I would like to introduce the Q&A modality for this session. So, well, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, there is a, um, yes, a little icon here uh, for Q&A. So doesn't matter what time you just enter your uh, question and towards the end of the uh, call, we will have 10 minutes allotted for um, answering these questions. And because of time constraints, if we cannot answer those today, um, the speaker will get back to you uh, through email. Um, and yeah, just a quick reminder, we also have a, another webinar coming up on May 7, um, also on Agile Environments. Uh, so sign up and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Dinkle. So I hope you can, you can see the contents and hear me good enough. So today it's my pleasure to talk a bit about Agile in Automotive. And um, before we dive into the actual contents, let's quickly have a look at uh, who's speaking. So basically that's me. I've spent my kind of my whole professional life in automotive software projects, worked as developer, architect, project lead, ended up taking responsibility for the digital cockpit practice here at Luxoft. And over the years, I have become a real believer into not only agile way of working, but also agile leadership, agile thinking, agile values. And I would like to talk about today a bit about um, how this fits into the automotive setup. So I prepared a couple of things for today. Let's start with the mobility revolution, things that are happening. Let's look a bit into the automotive industry, um, where we are and, and why this is a, a very exciting place to be at the moment. And then let's see how Agile fits into the whole game and what can be done improved applying agile methodologies, thinking, living, working into this. Good. Let's have a look at, isn't that beautiful? That is what we like to think when talking about automotive. So long roads, emotions, performance, individuality. But um, to be honest, and to be perfectly honest, it's, the reality it looks a bit more like, it looks more like this. Actually, going with a car in most cases is not fun. It is not fast. It's not about performance. It is time consuming necessity to get mobile, to go to work, go home again, to go to other places. And there's other downsides of the current setup of um, mobility as well. So when you look at this, this is also more of everyday life than the picture that we started with. Um, let's have another look into automotive as well. From a different angle, let's have a look at how automobiles have been very successfully been developed for more than over 100 years. Um, it's important to understand this when talking about Agile. So when an car manufacturer plans to set up a new car model on the street, they first pick a date five years to the future. This is the SOP date, the start of production, most important date in automotive. And then what they do is typically do a backward planning. So over the years before, we start out with rough sketches and basically this leads us to a lifetime of roughly three years to develop a full component. And as I'm uh, looking after the digital cockpit or the interior software that's required inside a car to create a, create a great stunning user experience, this is what I'm using as an example here. 
So roughly three years is what we have to create such an infotainment environment. And the idea, as you can see here, is that roughly three minus a couple of months, uh, three years roughly, the specification is frozen and will not change until the SOP. This is owed to the waterfall environment where we're in, because in the end, it, a car is still a mechanical product. It needs to be assembled in a factory, and this starts at a certain point. So there is a reason behind this mechanical engineering model in a waterfall way, and it worked pretty well for those mechanical parts. But if we take a look at who is the main competitor for in-vehicle infotainment systems, then after some consideration, we'll notice pretty quickly that it's actually not other cars. The competitor looks like this, or similar, right? But in essence, if you now take our three years timeline for development of a new IVI system, in-vehicle infotainment system, so what will smartphones look like in three years? Just think about the speed of development, the speed of innovation, of new technology, of hypes starting and stopping again. So what we see here is that we significantly have to change the way how vehicle systems are being developed these days and in the future. And to summarize, there are a couple of trends that drive the automotive industry, probably like no other at the moment. We see a digital lifestyle like mobile phones, di digital appliances, um, smart assistants, and so on, taking more and more important role of our lives. And we see in the car specifically electrification, which makes it easy for newcomers, new companies to actually build a car. It's by far not that difficult anymore if you build an electric car rather than a combustion engine. In addition to that, we have our sharing economy. So in the large and urban areas, it's way more important to be mobile rather than to own a car. And last but not least, the uh, trend towards more autonomy is actually a major driver for change because in an autonomous car, the differentiation is no longer how much horsepower do you have? How fast do you accelerate? It is more about how well can you spend your time? How valuable is it? How is the user experience in the car? How much work did you, uh, did you get done? Or how well did you get entertained while being driven by your autonomous car? And these major trends together will change the automotive industry quite significantly. And this is what we at Luxsoft call the mobility revolution. We're neither the first nor the only ones, of course, to identify these trends. However, um, as they are so important, I think it's important to notice them. Um, what we do at Luxsoft is our mission at Luxsoft Automotive is to co-create smart solutions that empower our clients to make the transition to sustainable mobility. So the result after the mobility revolution, where we have clean cars, where they are autonomously driving, where we have solved um, the mobility requirements and reached a sustainable state. And in this, from multiple different angles, we work together with our clients to co-create content technically, as well as to empower them with the right development teams and um, capabilities, among others, how to set up agile projects. So, again, what are we talking about? The mobility revolution, right? So, change, change is coming. Brace ourselves, brace yourselves. No, this is actually wrong. We are already in the very middle of it. Change is not coming. In automotive, it is here, it is all around us, and it will never be done. 
That's an important part. We are not just making this transition in the mobility revolution, and then at some point of time, we'll go back to, um, we'll go back to the, the former times where things are orderly, proper, uh, properly ordered, where everything is well sorted again. Actually, to give a, some examples, um, if you consider a connected product and cars are, meanwhile, and especially the new ones, are all connected products, they are never finished. If you think about what it would be like or feel like if you know that you have a connected car and there is secure certain exploits out there that will enable others to hack or invade your privacy, your data, as well as even more dangerous, the safety functions of your car. You would, as least, at least I would, definitely expect that the car maker continuously works to keep my product up to date and supply security patches, upgrades, improvements, and so on. So it's never finished. This is a major change. Another one that the automotive industry is going through. It's just not the way it used to be. So cars become, even though they are still mechanical to a large part, they are a different kind of product. The next thing, of course, might be obvious, but still, the requirements and markets change continuously. This is also something that we need to take into account when setting up projects in the right way. So, to summarize, if we want to be prepared for this, we need to build organizations that are able to continuously adjust to what is coming, to what needs do we have in the, uh, in the business. So, let's come to an easy question. Why do we do projects? And basically, let's start, let's start really, really simple. There's someone who has a business idea and a business opportunity, but thinks, oh, I cannot do this alone, so I need some help, right? And then there's someone who knows a specific technology or can help, has specific skills, and they form a team to develop according to the business idea. And I think what is important to understand and keep in the back of our minds when talking about how to set up projects, it's that the project success is actually about the business value that's being created. This is the most important thing. So when, let's look a bit at uh, something that's called the devil's square. Um, already uh, or first time documented by, by Henry Sneed, it's, and how to apply, apply this in an automotive IBI setting. So a project with a fixed price setup is fixed in four dimensions. We have a fixed cost, we have a fixed time, as well as a fixed quality of the deliverable, and we have a fixed scope, so we know kind of exactly in these four dimensions, that's the idea of what is going, the customer is going to get for the money that he pays. However, this leads to a tricky situation. If we come back to, uh, to the two people uh, having the previous discussion, because when you are tasked with this, um, you know that there's unforeseeable things. What you would do as a supplier is, okay, you add a little of risk buffer, more or less. Of course, our customers also not stupid. They will know, and they will ask for price reductions. In the end, this is kind of a negotiation, but the question is, where does this lead to? Will this, is this the right basis to create trust, collaboration, to maximize the business value in the end? And it turns out that it's not, for a couple of reasons. I guess many of you have seen this picture. 
probably this actual picture I've seen that 20 years ago. At that point of time, I really laughed about it and said, ha, 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 how can that ever happen? But if you consider this, in automotive, this is very much true. However, this picture only reflects a snapshot of reality. So in essence, this is just what the understanding of the different roles in a project is at one point in time. It completely leaves out of the game and out of the question how the individual perceptions of what is to be implemented evolve over time. So each of the individual perceptions change and of course the market requirements also change. And then there might be things such as human mistakes as well. So let's have a look at how expectations change and what this means for project success. So consider this a project. And the project has an initial direction, a content, a description, a list of requirements, you know, a target, which results in an initial expectation of what the customer wants to have or what the customer believes he wants to have at that point of time. However, due to uh, market changes, due to requirements, uh, adaptations, due to refinements, due to um, a lot of work and brain power spent on the project while we work, we learn new things. So we adjust our course and we get a new intermediate expectation of what we are supposed to do. And if we continue with this, then we can see that it, it's hard to depict this in two dimensions, but it goes a long way until we actually receive the result of what the project delivers. However, coming back to our devil's square example or uh, visualization, from that perspective, we would understand that only the initial expectation is the one that was contracted, while the actual project result is really what, what, what came out. However, the question is, as I started to, to uh, motivate, from a perspective of business value, is the actual result in this example now worse than what was initially contracted? Or can it be that this is even better because we respect and um, implement the things that we learn on the way while doing, while working on the project? So in most cases, there's a good reason to change the course and to alter the project result. And in essence, of course, everybody knows what's coming. If we call these iterations, we are pretty close to an agile approach, right? We adjust what we do while we do it with the overall goal to maximize the business value as we go. This is another very interesting uh, look at why do projects fail. It appears quite on top of uh, the, the Google list. And what is interesting here in this list um, is that basically there's no technical reason among the top 10 list in this selection from the projectmanagement.com. Um, there's no technical issues why projects fail. It's all about leadership, communication, and uh, really working, collaborating in, a, in an adequate way. Good, so it's easy. Let, let's just do the right things. Um, yeah, but, but how do we do that? How do we know what's right? How do, we, how do we get this started? And that's actually a pretty tricky question. And to do this, I'd like to, uh, to, to bring up the, the Kniffin framework. 
something that was developed by IBM in the year 2000, basically, to support their management decisions. And it's a helpful a categorization of problems. So let's have a look into the four different um, quadrants that we have. On the one hand, we have simple problems or simple uh, settings where basically we have no unknown things in the game. We know the relationship between the course and its event, and it's kind of obvious to all the people. So we can easily handle these. Then we have complicated situations where we know that there's a couple of unknown things that will become known as we go during the project. Here we go with good practices. So we know that the relationship between cause and events requires analysis, expert knowledge. We can handle this. But we also have complex situations. Complex situations is characterized by we don't know what we don't know. So we know there's things that we don't know, but we don't know how many, we don't know what. So it's a lot more difficult to really do the right things and plan up front. And then there's the last, the chaotic part of setups and problems, where basically we cannot know what will happen. And this is on a systems level, on a systems of systems, systematic, um, chaotic relationships. And if we look at this characterization of uh, the different challenges, our projects, our project reality, it's more, it's not in the simple area. In the simple area, this is where we can easily plan what to do. However, projects of the size that we have in automotive and in many other industries, they are not simple. They are at least complicated, more complex, sometimes even chaotic. So coming back to the question, what is right? Just to do the right things. Um, I think it's important to understand that there is no silver bullet. However, the maxim to, to maximize the business value, that is a good scale to rate what is good or better than others. And at its core, it really starts with having values for collaboration. Values that we use are respect, courage, openness, transparency, the focus, trust as well as commitment. And with these values, we pick a good starting point to do the right thing. This good starting point can be to start for a single team with a scrum setup, for instance. It could be to work in a Kanban mode. It could be to work um, and apply various other agile um, best practices or uh, even more, also a complex setup. From this good starting point, however, it is important that we take what we have, plan, execute, and observe, and then rethink, are we still doing the right things? Is it still the best we can do to reach our goal, maximize business level? And so we iterate through this. We replan, we execute, we observe, we replan, and so on. This is where Agile not only applies to software development, but to all the things that we do in our professional, even in our private lives. Good, let's have a look at something that's called delegation poker. And I um, borrowed this picture from uh, Management 3.0, uh, from Jürgen Appello, a great guy, by the way. And if we have a look at the different levels, seven different levels of delegation, where one means the manager tells the employee what to do, and level seven is the full delegation of decision-making in a certain area, 
then the traditional management is clearly on the levels one, to tell the employees to sell an idea and to consult them but still make the decision. That is the traditional management, uh, traditional management setup. However, would the assumption be correct to say that agile leadership is essentially on the other part of the scale? It turns out, no, not really. Agile is about taking the best and most adequate decision and approach for a certain time period iteration that we can work with. So agile leadership is really about using all of the tools to the best of their uh, abilities, given a certain setup, a certain, a certain scenario, a certain set of information that we have to decide. Good, so let's have a look, return to the devil square in agile projects. We still have our four dimensions, but what we know and what we learned is basically the content of a project and of each project. And I, I dare say there's not a single non-trivial project that has been delivered with the same content as specified initially, because we always learn things, we learn new stuff. So the scope can and will change over time. So what this means, if we look at a typical automotive project, um, and I've seen quite a lot of them happening in, in various positions and various um, situations, it always starts that we select a new supplier. Um, and we go to certain different stages, which we'll come into in a, on the next slides where we start with a well-documented start, if you want to. Then typically we go into cost negotiations and optimization. We have some kind of delay, which summing up, we have start to hide problems, which doesn't really work. Then we increase the project pressure, we increase the team growth and have a cost overrun, and then we get into a delayed SOP. So the start of production is late. But let's have a look at the individual stages, because I think it's pretty interesting what typically happens if you don't go agile and transparent, open with your customer. So new project, new supplier. That basically means we throw all the learnings away that we have so far. Every time. We have a new project, there's very little reuse. The change of supplier means a change of team. So all the personal networks, all the people that know each other, all the experience and processes need to be rebuilt and re-established. Very little reuse. How we work in Luxsoft in our automotive, um, agile, scaled way of working is that we focus on platforms rather than products. This means that we don't reinvent things, but we evolutionize from one generation to the next together with our partners. We reuse and work with open source in the right way. Right way means contributing back to the open source community. And every next generation of a product or of a work stream is an increment of the current generation, which helps us quite a lot to reuse the lessons learned and the technology. Well, in automotive, there is the idea traditionally that we can, the more documentation that we have, the better it is, which is not necessarily true um, because, well, how do you judge this in a very short time, right? We have overreaching expectations at customers, right? They just provide a couple of thousands of pages and expect that these will be read, understood, and um, will be respected in a proposal. How do you deal with 40,000 to 60,000 requirements? Really, really difficult. And complicating even more is that some of these are outdated, contradicting 
the requirements are inconsistent and incomplete. So we typically try to work in a different way, that we start with a high-level project concept, that we work with an ordered backlog that is jointly created and defined with the current, uh, with the customer and the uh, service team that is fully transparent and uh, helps us to, um, to embrace the change because we know that the backlog is incomplete, we know that it will grow and we know it will change. However, we make this transparent. We don't assume that we know everything, which is a crucial mindset change. Accepting that change will happen helps a lot. So in automotive, typically we have the next stage then, where we say, yes, we, now we have a proposal that we want, and then we go into cost negotiations, where we get price reductions, but still need to do the same thing, where we try to live up to the reduced budget that we have from the supplier side. And as a consequence, then typically project starts understaffed, on the, on the same time, we have a very high focus on the visible, uh, visible features rather than architectures or processes, which will lead to basically structural deficiencies, technical depth from day one, because the visual, visual things are way more important. And this is where the staffing focuses on. In contrast, It is important in an, in an agile way to keep these things really transparent. And again, coming back to the, to the combination of why do we do projects? A customer and a supplier, they want to achieve a business goal, business value together. So it is important to have the transparency. In agile, working with, an, with a backlog enables us to do the most important things first. And these are the ones that are most important to achieve the business value that the customer needs in their product. And the reiterative, the iterative replanning enables us to find smart solutions that focus on what is really the most important things, the most value adding features, stories, and epics. Good, next stage. In a typical automotive project, we see that in many cases that there's, a, um, I would say, a bad combination of delay and static planning, static traditional waterfall planning, assuming that we know everything up front. And, well, it already starts typically with the purchasing process, right? When you have a project that's supposed to be starting on uh, April 1st, you can be sure that it will probably be, be June, July, August, or even later. However, the assumption on both sides with a static planning is that, yes, this is still going to work out fine. This, the plan is still valid. Nobody wants to talk about um, milestone um, shifts that early in a project. Then we have typical problems that we have over-optimistic assumptions. Those delays, they, they sum up. And in the end, the project management managers have to do the best they can. But this whole, in many cases, results in a kind of a hope-driven development rather than making things um, transparent, doing early risk assessments and early countermeasures. So in contrast to that, how we work with small increments and iterations, this really helps us to um, understand the development velocity to uh, be able to know how fast our team or our teams in a larger setup, how uh, they work on the backlog. What is manageable? What is not manageable? And this is not just known to us. It is known to the 
whole team, the extended team, including the, the customers, the involved people to, uh, who work together to achieve the delivery in the end. Well, another thing that the automotive industry learned the hard way is like hiding problems has never worked. Never. So in many cases, suppliers try to, to hide delays and shortcomings. They maintain two different uh, queues, one for internal bugs, one for customer visible bugs, and try to fix as few of the internal ones as possible. And only try to focus on the absolute minimum that is required for the deliverables. But the time that's needed for architecture work, for refactoring, uh, for test strategy, tooling, validation, code quality, these are typically ignored and starved because they are not immediately visible. With an iterative approach, however, especially when we do this together with a customer, we immediately see where the uh, delays are and we can immediately and have the obligation to immediately uh, take countermeasures in terms of can we extend the team, can we parallelize work, can we get additional support or can we um, maybe reprioritize the backlog. And in terms of Agile, the retrospectives that are part of, for instance, a Scrum methodology that should happen also in, in other organizations on a management level, for instance, they really provide the, a great possibility to get feedback on improvement potential and to really improve while on the go. Good. Next stage is that we have increasing project pressure. So we all in automotive have experienced management escalations and there's task forces, added pressure, micromanagement, daily reporting. Um, we see weekend work and so on. However, the whole situation with the structural deficiencies, they are typically not addressed sufficiently. Rather than uh, the focus is on achieving milestones and customer visible features. How to deal with such situations? It's, from our perspective, it's really essential to work in a transparent way and to really try to avoid the waste of doing things double. A common anti-pattern in uh, these large kinds of complex projects is really to have two kind of uh, bug reports, not to use a common dashboard and common metrics one with one single point of truth, but rather that each company carries statistics of their own, measures things, beautifies statistics, and then there's loads of communication about what is the right values? What are the wrong ones? Where does this lead us? So it is from our perspective, really the focus needs to be on collaboration, on getting the things done for the project. It is of secondary import who is actually the, the, uh, the source of a problem. It is more important to focus forward looking onto how do we deal with this in a way that it generates the most business value. And for that, it is important to have the, the trust and the collaboration uh, mindset to focus on single uh, dashboards, metrics, and to have the same data, basically. Stage the next one. When we are in a delayed project, what managers like to do is throw people 
at a, pro, uh, at a problem. So this leads to team growth, cost overrun. And in many cases, this is not really, not really helping. In the end, it leads to significant pressure. It leads to um, growing teams, more communication overhead, more waste in reporting. It leads to decontenting and, in the end, shifted features. And again, in an agile way, the velocity can be extrapolated. We know how fast our teams are. We can extrapolate how much we are going to implement very early because we measure and continuously keep track of how fast our teams are. What is our throughput? Are we going to reach the end milestone roughly or are we going to miss it? So we can add, adjust early on. Good, and the last stage. As I'm currently here in Berlin, um, I suffered from this already today, a delayed and postponed SOP. And this is the worst thing kind of that can happen. And it happens so often in automotive projects. Because as I said in the beginning, Automotive development projects are about assembling cars in a factory with a certain starting point. And this SOP, if there is a delay that cars cannot be built because a certain critical component is missing for the factory, this has a huge, tremendous financial impact when cars cannot be sold and so on. So, Again, kind of the same things apply also to uh, focus on how to deal with such situations. The delay is mainly due to quality. It is mainly due to the fact that all the features in a traditional automotive uh, setup are of the same priority. I asked once an, an uh, automotive uh, OEM manager when we talked about agile and it's possible to change and so on, I asked them what features or which requirements are the most important ones? And the answer was, was oh, that's simple, all of them. And there you have it. This is the kind of problem that generates the issues uh, that we are facing here. So focus on creating potentially shippable increments after each sprint is a great value because the quality of the system, as far as it goes, is already up to a certain mark. The next thing is that feature-driven development. So developing feature verticals end-to-end -end really helps to implement, the, to implement the most important things first and to implement them in a way that we get value, business value from them. Good, so coming from this automotive example now back to, well, we continue changing towards better. From a traditional automotive project here where we have fixed cost, timeline, scope and quality, um, let, us, let us keep one thing uh, from, from this today, if it's not been clear all the way through already, change is not the exception. Change is the rule. It is happening. So to work in agile projects means we need to accept both on a supplier as well as on the customer side that we have to be somewhat flexible on scope. We cannot uh, we can run projects in a way that we don't compromise on uh, the other qualities. However, um, sticking with the Agile manifesto really, really helps it. But this is not just a matter of applying Scrum, for instance, to a project. It is a mindset that needs to, to run.
Good, and here's basically one example of a great project that was done in just that way. The MBUX system that was launched or this February in the new A-class is something that we developed, that we co-developed together with Daimler. And it basically shows that the agile approach in automotive is working and it really has benefits to generate extraordinary results in large and complex systems. Good. With this, I would very much like to thank you for the attention. Thank you for uh, listening. And I think it would be good to have a look at some questions. So, Pavel asked, is it possible to download this presentation? I assume we will make it, uh, we will make it available somewhere. Then, Umar asked, it is a common practice in automotive projects to delay investments uh, as much as possible during the three years development phase in order to make sure no investment is done without certainty. So under agile perspective, specs and investments should be done at sprint level. So the question is how the two visions are aligned. Um, from my perspective, you are right in a way, assuming that it happens a lot of times that Investments specifically into infrastructure, into architecture, into tooling, for instance, um, into testing, into validation strategies. These things are significantly delayed. However, I would not necessarily say that this is a planned thing. I would much rather assume that this is due to the um, due to the surrounding set up and due to the circumstances that we in many cases don't have the bandwidth because because we are delayed and we have a focus on the wrong things so from my perspective this is to some extent a matter of prioritization as well as of not of consequently thinking through the risks that certain decisions take Good. The next question. Um, so, Konstantin asked, how do you determine when good enough version of the product will be ready? So, that's, a, I think, a very good question. Um, first of all, it is important to have a common understanding of what good enough actually means. And good enough has, from my perspective, the, the clear connection to the customer perspective, right? What we need to do is, in a large project or complex setup with multiple teams, where it is not a, a short-term, kind of simple area, speak in Kinefin, uh, we would need to have a number of acceptance criteria defined that really describe system attributes which help us to um, uh, which help us to judge jointly and transparently when a product is good enough for deliverable. And of course, looking at the iterative approach with multiple uh, sprints, one after the other, where after each sprint, we will have a, um, a sprint demo where we will see the result of the work. It is helpful to um, 
have two, um, uh, two, two dimensions of good enough. One is the functional good enough, which is clearly something that grows over time and a customer can decide to take the existing code and deliver it whenever they want to. The other one is a non-functional good enough. Like, for instance, a common um, question is startup times, right? So how fast does a system start up um, and when is it good enough? And bringing these two together then uh, should continuously tell us jointly and we have, should have a joint understanding of when good enough is good enough. Wow, that's quite a lot of um, questions. How frequently, that's a good one, Yevgin uh, asked, how frequently do you think it is possible to make releases in the automotive industry? So basically, there, there's two things from what we want to, uh, or where we need to be and where we need to go. As, we, as I said, our, our competition is not slow moving. We need to be better to enable people to do, have a better user experience in the car than they do on their mobile phones. And to achieve this, the goal that we uh, follow within our projects is to have, after each sprint, something that is potentially shippable. Every night, a nightly build that goes into the car that can be test driven. I hope that gives the idea. However, when you call a software um, build a release or not, this in the end, of course, depends on more things, right? Whether you actually deploy a software into the cars, uh, depends on the update strategy um, and the urgency of the implemented changes. And this is up again to the, uh, to the, to the OEM. Good, then the next question. So, Harry asked from the slide of well-documented, the guy behind the, the big stack of paper, um, what is the high-level project concept? Could you explain a bit more? So, um, it is important to, when we work with, in a typical Scrum setup, the most important um, asset that the whole team works on is the joint back. You know, you're all aware the product owner has the duty of filling the backlog with user stories defined to, according to a certain structure with the right contents, the definition of done, and the, um, and the development team takes these user stories, judges them, um, they do a planning poker or similar things, evaluates them, implements them according to the definition of done. However, we, in automotive, we typically do not, cannot assume that we start with a backlog. So this means that at the beginning of a project, of a complex project, we typically start with a, an inception phase where together with the customer, uh, we create the high-level project concept. And this means that we have specific people with specific roles, such as system architect or a system product owner, working together to create um, the high-level understanding, high-level architecture, as well as high-level um, features that a certain system needs to build and needs to implement. And we also work on the high level um, requirements, also the non-functional ones that need to be implemented. And this is then what goes into the work stream for the product owners. It is their task together with the system product owner to break down the individual features into uh, consumable, digestible user stories for the teams to implement.
Good. So, let me have another question. So here's, here's a very interesting one. Robert asked, do you have experience in implementing management 3.0 in your organization or team? If so, what was the biggest challenge you faced? So I, I really like this question um, because I explicitly think that the management 3.0 principles are actually very valuable for an organization and for a management team. Yes, um, in one of my uh, former organizations, I have worked together with a great team to implement these principles in an organization of 230 people. And we actually worked a lot we applied a lot of um, agile principles in this setup. Like, for instance, um, having a backlog for the management team, like having daily meetings. So we really took the various things and applied them to the best of uh, what we saw helped us doing our job, generating our part of the business value for the company. The biggest challenge there, I think, was twofold. On the one hand, that this is actually hard to be done if um, this mindset change is not, um, I would say, a common feeling, not only in, in the, the part of the organization, but also around it. And it, I think, breaks with a couple of Typical, um, typical principles, right? So in, in many companies, you run with a need to know principle. So basically, you share information only as much as absolutely needed. However, um, what we did is we, we turned it around and we said, okay, by default, everything is public, unless there's a very good reason not to show something to people. And this is something where I think it generates value because information is accessible and it's available to the people who work together. However, it is not easy to, to, to convince someone who has been like working 40 years in a need to know setup uh, that this is actually a smart idea. So that's really difficult to, uh, to achieve. So, this is also a, a good one, and I think it should probably be the, the last one here. When do you decide, or how to decide, when to use agile development or other types of development? That's a question by Gabriel. And from my understanding, um, in automotive, we often have the, the question, is SPICE, automotive SPICE, as a process framework helpful? Does it bring added value? Or um, is it just an, a burden on, in, in terms of loads of additional documentation work where we think that uh, the Agile Manifesto says um, we should on color, focus on collaboration rather than on documentation? But um, in essence, in a lot of cases where, where for instance, when you work with safety critical, um, safety critical systems, there is legal requirements. And uh, for instance, you need traceability to, to show which requirement or which code is tested by a certain um, test case, where there is a lot of um, process assets and process descriptions and way of working available 
that you can just reuse and you don't need to, to reinvent it. So in some cases, if you just follow the, the steps that are described in a, in a well uh, set up process, I don't think that um, you actually do extra work, but you reuse in a smart way what is already there. I'm not saying that it is either or, right? If you think Agile is about freestyle, no rules, it's about no coding conventions, it is about, well, everybody is more an artist than an engineer, then this is not my understanding. My understanding is Agile at its core is about working to the best of what we know and making sure that we continuously improve what we do in small iterations so that we can adjust in an agile way. And of course, we can work on spice artifacts, for instance, in an agile way, right? If we apply, for instance, the document, uh, definition of done in a way that we need to write a test case for a piece of code before it is considered done, then this is both agile and it helps us to achieve potentially the, the goals of other process descriptions. So I don't think that is as, as an X or, it is rather more how we organize ourselves. Good, I think I have to stop now. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Midi, for that awesome presentation. All right.